Yeah. Well, Tom. Well, am I am I hot? No. Yes. <laughs> yes. Or no, I mean, is my mic? Did you turn it on? Is it on? Oh, do I have to turn it on? Yeah, you got to yeah. turn it on. Oh, there you go. Hello. Yeah. There we go. Hey. Are we up? Oh, there we go. Coming in hot, bro. Well, brothers and sisters, greetings from Madison, Wisconsin. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Carol and I are just so fired up to be here. Uh, partly because you're just so awesome yes. and wonderful to be, be uh, you know, just to fellowship with. The other part is, uh, it's just it's just like coming home. Yeah. Even though we were only here for four years, it really is. Just to be able to connect with everybody and see everybody, it is just amazing to be able to be here. I want to show you a couple quick slides. You say, gosh, Tom, you went to Wisconsin. Is anything different about your life in Wisconsin? Right. And uh, I'll, I just have to show you a couple pictures. First of all, uh, is this working? Click here? down, click down, click down. Click down. Oh, click down, okay. There we go. We moved to Wisconsin, and what do you do in Wisconsin? You hang around barns. That's what we do now. We, we are barn people, and uh, we like barns. We're kind of like uh, Mark and Sarah D'Angelo. They're barn people. We, we hang out on farms all the time now. Uh, then also, we took it to another level. Uh, there we are on tractors. We're at Hennig Farms. And, you know, we, we eat cheese all the time, and we eat crawfords, and... Uh, uh, we root for, well, we root for Wisconsin. I can't bring myself to root for the Packers. Uh, we also have a dog. It's pretty amazing. Uh, he is, uh, when we moved, Joy, Joy has been asking Carol and I for a dog for years. She said, gosh, can we get a dog? And I always stood firm. I'm like, no, because I know who's going to take that dog out at 6 o'clock in the morning to go to the bathroom when it's 15 below. But then when we, when we moved us again, we were moving from here to Wisconsin. I said, okay, let's get a dog. And uh, so guess who takes the dog out at 6 a.m. when it's 15 below? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I was a prophet. I knew exactly how that was going <laughs> But I have to say, I think of all of us, I think I'm the most into the dog. Now maybe Joy and Luke and Carol would all argue about that, but I just love the dog. I walk around the house going, I love you, Paul. His name is Paul after the Kung Fu Panda Warrior. I just walk around and look. Even, even Luke has mentioned, Daddy, like, you're just a little too cute around the dog. It's kind of like taking a hit on my man card. <laughs> now, also, I've been working out a little bit. There you'll see. Like, <laughs> my, my gums are a little bit bigger. And, uh, this is, uh, we're, we're just getting ready for the shindig, the softball tournament in uh, September. So, anyway, I just wanted you to know uh, what is going on in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, since we've been there, we've had, we've had some great victories. Um, you know, we ended up, uh, we got to Madison, we were able to find a building, a church building for the church. Yeah. Uh, and it really was a total God story. I was looking around for a place, maybe we could meet some, anywhere, somewhere, just trying to find different places. And uh, God just opened the door for us to be able to uh, get a building. They, these, and it's a long-term lease, they renovated it, renovated it for us. And then when we left the hotel, I asked, Carol said, you should ask the hotel for chairs. And I'm like, really? Why should I ask the hotel for chairs? But you know, Carol always asks. So anyway, so I went and I asked, I asked the hotel, I said, hey, you got any chairs around here? Two hours later, I get an email saying, congratulations, we're gonna donate 200 chairs to the Madison Church of Carolina. So everybody thinks I have faith, it's really Carol. Carol has faith right through me. And uh, we get 200 hotel chairs for our, our building. It's pretty amazing. Uh, we also have campus ministers there. Matt Navy Kinzer, if any of you know Matt Navy Kinzer. Uh, it was just an amazing, miraculous move how God did that. Uh, but we are, we're making progress. We're going forward in the church. And, you know, there's always drama, right? In, in any church, there's drama. In fact, you may, no matter how long you've been a member of the church, you probably cannot ever remember a time when there was no drama going on in the church. That's just church life. You think it's about peace, but it's really about drama. It's actually about peace and the drama. Peace and the drama. 
Come on. Now, perhaps one of the reasons you're in church today is you want to get closer to God. Yeah. We all want to get closer to God. That's why you go to church on Sunday morning. If you didn't want to get closer to God, you would go to the flea market, or you would go <laughs> antiquing, or you would go to the other places that Damon uh, said that people go on Sunday morning. Yeah. But where do you where do you start? You know, I I think you can look at just your other relationships in life, yeah. and you can start making connections on how to get closer to God. Right. Now, if I want to get closer to guys, I'm 53 now, if I want to get closer to guys who are like me, or old, you know, basically old men, right, who can't play football and baseball anymore, uh, I say, what do we do? We, we go play golf, yeah. Yeah. right? We go look at the, we look at a golf, hey, you want to play golf? So we can, we can stand a lot or perhaps ride around in a car, uh, you know, just, just play a game. And then, and then we bond. We talk while we're playing golf. But that's it. If I want to build relationships with people who are my age, I start talking golf with them. Now, when I want to build a relationship with Carol, my wife, because we're going to be celebrating our 25th anniversary uh, in, a couple, in a couple weeks, 25 years. Uh, I bamboozled her, and I got her stuck, ah. stuck to me, and she's, she's gutted it out for 25 years. What an incredible Christian woman she is. <laughs> but I suggested for our 25th anniversary, let's go to the, the let's go to Ridley Field and see the San Francisco Giants play the Cubs on a weekend series. Wouldn't that be an amazing way to celebrate our 25th anniversary? <laughs> You would say if, no, actually I didn't do that, but you would say if you did do that, Tom, you're not very smart. You're just not one, you're just not a sharp brother. Yeah. And uh, no, you know, what, what I did and what we did, we talked about is we're going to go to Bar Harbor, Maine. And uh, that's where we went for our honeymoon. This is our first time back in 25 years to go back from where we went for our honeymoon. And so, like, there's now when we started talking about that, Carol, all of a sudden, Carol's like, oh, and then, like, here she starts waving her hands. It's just amazing. It's this incredible, it's this incredible time of impact. But if you want to get close to somebody, you ask, you ask the compelling question, what are they into? Right. If we want to get close to God, the compelling question is, what is God into? There you go. What does God like to do? Come on, bro. Now, at first glance, like there's, there's a lot of things that God is into, but I would say the two things that really just stand out, stand off the page of my uh, 26 years of being a disciple, two things that are just really obvious and they're a great place for us to start and to think about, is it, it's the Bible and people. Yeah. It's the Bible and people. And it's not only the Bible and people, it's the Bible in people. And then it's the people in the Bible. It's the Bible. It's kind of like, do you remember those old Reese's peanut butter cup commercials? Yes. If you're from the 70s, you remember the guy riding on the bicycle and he hits the guy walking. One guy's carrying a jar of peanut butter and the guy on the bike is eating a chocolate and they run into each other and the guy shoves his chocolate into the peanut butter jar. And then the guy with the peanut butter is like, man, you got chocolate in my peanut butter. And then the... The chocolate guy is like, man, you got peanut butter on my chocolate. And then they eat the, they take it, they eat the peanut butter and the chocolate together. And then they're like, oh, this is good. <laughs> Two great tastes that taste great together. Reese's peanut butter cups. God knew that when he, like God is like into people in the Bible, like those old Reese's peanut butter cup commercials. Two great tastes that go great together. Right. It's the word and it's people and it's people and the word. Right. Come on, bro. Now, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at an episode in the book of Acts. Okay. Acts chapter 17. Okay. And uh, the book of Acts is the unfolding of the first century church as led by the Holy Spirit. From this event, we're going to see, we're going to see as we look through this event, we're going to see perhaps what God is into. My on the radar agenda is to help us uh, understand how to get a little bit closer to God. Okay. My off the radar agenda is that you would learn to be curious and thirsty for yourself oh, yeah. to find those things that God is into. Mm -hmm. So let's go to Acts chapter 17. Come on, bro. Come on, Tom. Paul is in the city of Athens by himself. He was sent ahead from Berea. Uh, he, when he was in Berea, he was he. He is just a lightning rod for persecution. Sure. So when he's in Berea, they, they, the, the, the 
Jewish people are trying to get him out of town. They beat him up. They attack him. They try to arrest him. And then, so the other disciples are like, Paul, get out of here. When he was in, and before that, he was in Thessalonica. The exact same thing happened. They had to lower him out of the city in a basket to get him out of, the, get him out of town. Before that, he was in Philippi, and he was uh, being attacked. He was in a, uh, he had been flogged. He had been put in a dungeon. I mean, you can almost see, like, as you go through Paul and his missionary journeys, you see that he's under tremendous resistance right. when he goes to try to preach the word. Yeah. You can see almost even the formation of his understanding in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 12, where he says, my strength is made complete in my weakness. Wow. You see, it was formed. It was formed in this cauldron of suffering as he went through. You know, he's trying to be a disciple. And then there's this constant resistance along the way. Mm. So Paul is going to Athens now. And uh, he, <clears throat> Athens was an interesting city. Yeah. It was especially known, like at that time in the world, Athens would have been considered one of the elite cities of the world. Culture, sports, arts, everything. So when people went to Athens, they would immediately be impressed with the city, the architecture there, the people there, the education there. Everything about Athens was known, even on the face of the world, as gosh, that is one of the finest cities in the world. Yeah. And Paul goes to Athens, leaving persecution behind, and the first thing, like what, what is amazing about Paul is how he sees it differently. Uh, than the rest of people. Right. Go to Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Okay, Wait. come on, bro. The Bible says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed. That word direct, distressed is paraxuno, which means provoked to anger, mm. to see that the city was full of idols. Mm. So Paul looks at the city, and instead of being impressed with the architecture and the people, and I know I get like that. If I go to Chicago, I'm so impressed with the skyline, and then, the, you know, the Lake Michigan and the Lakefront, Navy Pier. But when Paul went to Athens, equally impressive. But what he, was, what he saw was he was bothered by the spiritual condition of the city. Uh, so he reasoned, so initially, then he's like, okay, instead of waiting for uh, Paul and Barnabas to get, or instead of waiting for Barnabas to get to the city, Barnabas and Silas, instead of waiting for them, he decides, hey, I'm going to do something about it. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, yep. as well as the marketplace day by day with those who happen to be there. So his, his response is, hey, you know what? I've got to do something about the spiritual condition of the city that I'm in. So he goes to the synagogue where apparently he's credentialed. He can do sermons. And then they kind of throw him out of there. And then he decides, hey, I'm going to go to the marketplace and I'm going to start talking to people there. And then while he's in the marketplace, a group, a group of... Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Now, both both of those philosophies originated about 300 years before before uh, Jesus came on the scene. 300 years BC, and so in the city of Greece, they had these philosophies, and these were a couple of the older philo Greek philosophies. They would have been similar to religions, where the end aim of the philosophy was happiness or was peace of mind. Uh, both Epicurean and Stoic. Epicurean was more of a like if you just live the perfectly balanced life, it will give you this great experience of pleasure. And Stoics were more concentrated on getting rid of emotion altogether and really relying upon your logic. You know, in fact, we still call people who show very little emotion, we use that reference all the time. You know, they're, they're very Stoic by nature. Yeah. Uh, that comes from this philosophy. But people followed the Stoics and they followed the Epicureans almost like religions. They, people were into these philosophies. Yeah. And where does that come from? It comes from the same thing. We're all trying to find solutions mm. to how to tackle life. Right. So anyway, these people come upon him and they begin to debate with them. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? <laughs> the word babbler comes from the term spermologos, uh, which is actually bird feeder. Mm -hmm. There were the major philosophies of the day were people who, uh, like the Epicurean and the Stoics, they were the major ones. They had a or, uh, infrastructure, they had, they, they had a whole congregation or following of people. And then there were other people who were trying to do almost like startup churches. 
they would hear different logic and then they would stand on the street corner and they would try to teach and explain to people the different, their different philosophy and they were trying to build their own group of followers. And that's what they're referring to. And they, their, their term, the term they were called was this thing called bird feeders. Right. So he's saying, hey, what's this babbler? What's this bird feeder doing? They, they, so it's a term of disrespect. They're totally looking down on him. Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him. Now the Areopagus was a court, uh, and what happened at the Areopagus was, this is where they fleshed out issues of religion, issues of education, occasionally issues of corruption in the time where Paul was there. So they're like, hearing this guy, this is a different philosophy, let's take him to the Areopagus. Maybe we can even get him in trouble, or we can shut him down, or maybe even they'll think he actually has something to say, but they get him to go to the Areopagus. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears. <clears throat> Uh, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at the objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So Paul is essentially, he's got this shot, he's in front of the Areopagus, and this is his introduction to his sermon, right? He, like he does a great job, like every preacher does, or like a good preacher does, is he tries to connect with the need of his audience. Oh, yeah. Essentially, you have the unknown God, you don't know what that's about, and I'm going to explain it to wow. you today. Right. So they're like, okay, yeah, you know, tell us, and then we'll decide whether or not we're interested in what you have to say. So anyway, Paul stood up, uh, verse 24. And this is so cool. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible because of the detail with which Paul testifies to who God is. He doesn't start with trying to even convert them to Christ. He takes the time to explain to them exactly who God is. In verse 24, the Bible says, The God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples built by human hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of our own poets have said, we are his offspring. So he's explaining God and the reality of life for people. He's explaining, hey listen, God is this amazing God who doesn't need any help from you or from me. It's, it's really great sometimes when you talk to people who don't believe in God, and like you tell them, hey, listen, God doesn't need you to believe in them. That always kind of catches them off guard. They're like, what? What do you mean he doesn't need? No, you're, 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 you're religious. You need me to, to believe in your God or you're not going to be. Anyway, it, these interesting conversations you sometimes get with people who don't believe in God. But he's saying that's who God is. We don't know anybody or anything that is self-existent like God is. That doesn't need anything. Plants need things. Animals, anything that's alive that we know of has need. And of course, the thing that's alive that has the most needs are perhaps you and me. Uh, maybe just me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but he explains this. And then he explains, hey, God is literally sovereign. And he's the Lord of heaven and earth. And he begins to explain. He's not just a God who deals with the harvest. He's, he is the God that is self-existent, he doesn't need us, he arranges everything on the chance that we might reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each of us. Come on. And it's just, even just on the chance that we would reach out to him. Do you know God's not very far from us? Sometimes it feels like he's far from us. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. It's like, man, where is God? Where is God? But he's literally, he's, he's right here, he's right with us. 
And when he's not showing himself, he's teaching me a lesson. And when he shows himself, he's teaching me a lesson. He's teaching me, he's teaching us lessons just all the time. And he wants us to, to, to understand. He wants us to believe that he's this, he's, he is who he is, and that he's right there, and we just need to reach out for him. Amen. And Paul's explaining that. Verse 25, verse 29. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, so therefore, since these things are true, this is how you want to think about God. Therefore, since we're God's offspring, we shouldn't think that the divine being is like gold and silver or stone or an image made by human design and skill. God's not limited like that. He's not like us. He's way, I mean, he's just infinitely beyond us. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. In other words, in the past, God overlooked the fact that people didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, Hey, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, and a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. So Paul explains these things about God. Then he, he talks a little bit about Jesus. And then finally, people begin to respond to his message. Now, I really believe when you go back over this, there's a few things that we can see real clearly and real briefly about uh, just understanding what God is into. Okay. So, uh, so God puts, I really look at the Bible and I think, why, I'll ask the question, even when I read an episode in the book of Acts, why did God even put that, why did God allow that episode to be placed in the book of Acts? Right, right. Come on. When you look at Paul, one of the things that's amazing about him is his capacity to see spiritually. Yes. Right. So the way he looked at life, the way he was looking at the city of Athens was not the way people look at Athens. He was looking at the city the way God looks at the city. Yeah. That he saw the spiritual condition in the world around him. Uh, he wasn't impressed by the accomplishments of men, but he was distressed over the lack of honor given to God. Now, I happen to be a big sports fan, and I love ESPN, but sometimes it annoys me how much they give honor and glory to people instead of giving honor and glory to God. Yeah. You know, that, oh, this guy's the greatest of all time. Now, I just, I kind of <laughs> like that stuff, but then I get annoyed. I'm like, well, what about saying, man, look what God did. He created somebody who has the capacity Amen. to be that at right. Right. Look what God did. He created a guy like Kevin Durant, six foot 11 with arms 20 feet long. And he's more, <laughs> he's more athletic, twice as much, twice as athletic as the average guy on any day, even with uh, his Achilles torn. Mm. And uh, <laughs> look what God did instead of look what people did. But that's how Paul, that's how Paul saw things. Now, then a question could be, well, gosh, I want to be like Paul, because God's into that. God's into it when we, he's into us, when we see life in a spiritual way. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Come on, Tom. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, For he knows a person's thoughts, for who knows a person's thoughts, this is Paul speaking, by the way, except their own spirit within them. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. How do you get to a place where you see things from the perspective of God it's by dedication in your relationship with God. It's funny, when, when I first, like when, when we first got in the ministry, praise God for Carol. Because Carol, like we would run into problems and I just wouldn't know what to do. And Carol would be like, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? In fact, we still go like that. Whenever I have a problem, I say, Carol, give me three solutions. Boom. <laughs> she goes, pop, 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 pop. Carol has just this amazing can-do spirit. Uh, this can-do mentality. In fact, years ago when we were in the West region, we showed up at the church building, the Journey of Faith, and uh, we didn't have the keys. The key fell off my key ring in Florida. And I call up Carol, and I'm like, Carol, give me three solutions to this problem. The church is going to be here in about 20 minutes. <laughs> Where should we go? And then, anyway, she, she, she had some marvelous solutions. 
but was able to see things that I couldn't see. The way we see the things that God sees are we have to spend time looking at the way the Bible teaches us to see things. Right. And God's Spirit Himself begins to change us on the inside. Yeah. So that the way that you look at your neighborhood, you don't look at your neighborhood as intimidating. You look at your neighborhood as desperately needing a relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah. You don't look at your high school as just a place of depravity. Uh, or just this horrible place. High school is just horrible. Well, maybe you do look at it as a place to be But you look at it, man, these are, these are people who, gosh, if, oh, if they could just have a little bit of understanding of faith in God, mm. they would do so much better with their lives. And maybe their whole trajectory of their life could change. Yeah, Tom. And it's the Spirit of God. The, the Spirit that's in God begins to be the Spirit that's in us as the Holy Spirit grows in us. And then we're able to see things different. And then God's like, I'm into that. The word is in you and the spirit's in you and it's alive. And God's like, oh, I'm into you when you're into that. Right. And you can almost picture God getting fired up and excited about that. Right. Come on, bro. So how you see things reflects your relationship with God yeah. and whether or not you live for him. Right. The second thing that God's into is Paul engaged spiritually. So it, Paul apparently didn't get out his iPad and write down a meticulous, detailed plan of assault on the city of Athens. He was just like, oh, hey, the last city I went to the synagogue, I'll go to the synagogue again and see if they'll let me preach. And then after that, it says he went to the marketplace and started talking to people. It doesn't sound like he was too strategic. I mean, there's no mention in the Bible about a strategy. He, he did have a strategy, go to the marketplace and go to the synagogue. But you know what he did? He just, he was like, you know what? I'm gonna do something right. about the condition that I see. I'm gonna respond to what I see. And he decides to engage people around him. Now, I, I think it's also interesting about his engagement is that even though he's provoked to anger in his spirit, he's upset, gosh, you know what? Even though most, almost everybody doesn't give glory and honor to God, Ah, that burn, even though that's the way the majority is, it shouldn't be that way. It just shouldn't be that way. So he's upset. And I'm going to do something about it. But he doesn't get angry. He doesn't go run around Athens, you know. In fact, I'm just thinking a little bit about the mass shootings, you know, these last couple of days as far as how to engage in crises. You know, it's not to, get, to decide to get angry and go off on people and demonstrate and just show your anger. The response to crises and the response to seeing things that is, that is not right, the response is to go engage people spiritually. Yeah. And he went to the synagogue and he began to share his testimony about how Jesus changed him. He went into the, the, he went into the marketplace and he began to talk to people about his relationship with God. He began to share things with them. He engaged and he started doing something about it. He didn't know who he was going to be. He had no idea whether anybody was going to follow. He just went and he just said, something's got to be done. You know, brothers and sisters, there's all kinds of places in our lives where we can engage spiritually. You know, if you go to school, you can engage at your school. You know, if you're in your own family, you can engage in your own family. Sometimes that's the hardest place to actually have conversations that matter. Yeah. You know, where you go in your own family, you're like, maybe it hasn't gone good the last couple times we tried. I don't really want to try again. But you know what? God is into it when we engage spiritually. Amen. Even if it goes bad, he would rather have it go bad while we're trying than for us to not do or say anything about yeah. what's going on in our lives. Yeah. How about financially? Do you engage your finances spiritually? Do you engage your career spiritually? Do you engage your spouse spiritually? Like what God is, what God's into, he's into us deciding, hey, I don't know, I don't know why it's like this, but I need to do something about it. Yeah. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna engage. You know, I don't know what I'm doing, but by golly, I'm going to engage. Come on, Tom. You know, we moved to Madison, and uh, let's just say there were a lot of challenges in the church. I'd actually never led a church before. So, you know, I think I could officially be a part of the I don't know what I'm doing club. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. But I, I acted like I knew what I was doing. So I'm like, okay, you know, hey, they don't know this, so I'll just act like I know what I'm doing. 
really the, the solution is just one person at a time, right. engaging, loving, giving, right. sharing the things that I believe with them, right. serving, laying down your life, mm -hmm. and eventually over time, things just get better. Yeah. Uh, no matter, some, wow. like, sometimes they go bad for a while, but they eventually get better, better if we keep engaging. God loves that. Amen. Finally, that, that, or I shouldn't say finally, the third thing is just Paul testified accurately about God. When Paul began to speak about God, he had really taken the time to think through what he really believes about God and explain it correctly in the situation. He says, this is who God is. Have you taken the time to really figure out what you believe about God? You just got to sit there and think about it. What does the Bible say about God? What do I believe about God? Are there differences? And then work out those differences. We used to do at midweek testimony practice. Uh, we would sit down and we would write out our testimonies. We'd practice our testimonies. We'd practice them with one another. The bold people would stand up front and they would, they would share their testimony. But what you're practicing is being able to explain God to other people. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the first time you do it, maybe it's bad. It isn't going to work. It's not going to sound real good. You're going to be like, hey, you know, I just got to tell you. I, I got baptized, and you need to get baptized too, right? You just start pointing. And you get your finger out, and you point at people, and you need, to, you need to do it. And then the next time you try it, you're like, uh, okay, hey, I go to a great church. And you kind of get your cool on, you know, hey, I go to a great church, you come to my church. And they're like, oh gosh, man, you're just, you're a weirder than when you're pointing at <laughs> But over time, you practice. And you just practice talking to people about what you believe about God. It could be in the church, out of the church, anywhere. You just practice pretty soon, and you're looking pretty soon. No, this is who God is. Your experience, you begin to know and understand. Amen. Sometimes just out of fear of failure, we don't do and say that we don't practice. We don't practice Christianity. And what, what we want to be is we want to be people who talk about this stuff all the time with each other and what we're learning. And that's and when we do, God's into that. Right. He's into that. And he's like, the, the better you get at it, the more he's going to set you up with places to share because he's like, ooh, you're getting it right. Man, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you somebody to share to and share with that's going to make a difference. Amen. And finally, the last thing that God's into. So God's God's into it when we see things the way God sees things. God's into it when we engage spiritually. God's into it and into us when Paul, when, when we testify accurately about him. And then God's into like doing really cool miracles. Yeah. Like even in this situation, Paul wasn't bothered by being insulted. He's like, you know, they're like, what's this babbler trying to say? And then the next thing you know, he's got an audience in front of a court and he's explaining God to these people. Like oh, he just went from like talking on the street to all of it, to having just an amazing group of people to talk to. And the whole, like God was doing that. God was doing that. God was doing that. Now, uh, I want to give you a little bit of an example here. I forget, there you testify. And then finally, God's glory on earth. Uh, we get to Madison, and uh, I'm on campus and sharing my faith. So when I share my faith with people on campus or talk to people, I'm like trying to talk to somebody who's 30 plus years younger than me. So I'm like, hey, do you want to study the Bible? And they're like, no, sir. Uh, maybe you know my grandpa. Come on, Tom. So we're, I'm sharing my faith in the union with this young guy, Gian, and we're sharing it. And uh, we just prayed, hey, God, show us to the guy that's open. And then all of a sudden, there's this guy running through our union with his backpack on. And I get in front of him and I say, hey, do you want to study the Bible? <laughs> right, I, you, you're like, wow, Tom, that couldn't be a worse strategy. Right? <laughs> hey, do you want to study the Bible? <laughs> the guy stops, he's like, he's like, I do. <laughs> I said, what church do you go to? He says, I've never been to church. Wow. He said, but I have a Bible in my backpack. My parents always told me I should read the Bible, but I never knew where to start. So I had it tattooed on my chest. He had Romans 8, 28 tattooed on his chest, just the verse. But he said, I, I thought maybe that would help. Glory. 
And long story short, we, we, we exchanged numbers and we studied the Bible and he became a disciple. This is him up here. That's Jake. Uh, but when you're into the things that God is into, God is into letting you know how awesome and cool it is. Yeah. And so God opens the door for new relationships. He opens the door for new disciples. He opens the door for God in any area of your life, work, marriage, family, anything. When you're into the things God's into, God is the one that opens the door. This yeah, is not a sermon about evangelism. This is a sermon about opening the door and experiencing God in a greater way. Brothers and sisters, just, just to wrap it up, when you give something to someone, you try to consider what they love. If I'm gonna give a gift for Carol, I think about what her heart loves. We know, we know that God loves people and he loves his word. You know, God loves it when we see things the way that he sees it. God loves it when uh, we, we engage and take spiritual action. God loves it when we do the hard work to know exactly what we test, when we testify about him, we testify correctly. And God loves to dis display his power. You know, none of us are experts in this. I'm not an expert in this. I'm just trying to figure these things out for myself. But this is the, this is the direction I'm trying to head. That's God into that I may be into those things as well. Uh, but I really believe this is some of the vision, some of God's vision for our church. And uh, whether you're young or old, that you also can be into the things God's into. Mm -hmm. So this week, let's get the vision of being a congregation of disciples who not only work together, Come on, bro. but we help each other be able to be into the things that God is into. Amen.
will be dismissed, but I want to announce to the church that one of the things that make us super excited are baptisms, but also not just baptisms, is when people uh, restore their relationship with God and come back to the fellowship. I want to let you know that Lynette Miller has been restored there. Very excited about that.